turn this thing on? Yeah, I'll try. Was it? <laughs> hey! Yep, yep, I do, yeah, I just yeah, turned it on. Turn on. Yep, yeah, I just turned it on. Sweet. <laughs> cool. Oh, folks coming in. Hello, hello. Hey. Jeez. Hey. <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> Sweet. Cool. Oh, well, maybe I should start talking. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, so my name's Nick Shu, and um, I'm here to talk to you about deploying Drupal on Kubernetes. Oh, yeah, come in. Yep, come on in. <laughs> Sweet. So... Um, yeah, okay, so um, let's see if this works. Oh, 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 cool. So um, I'm an operations lead at Previous Next. Um, I started as a developer and then slowly transitioned over time. Um, I've been on a five year journey into like operations, and I think that's in doing consulting and hosting. And I, to me, I think that's my edge, like coming from the development world. Um, and as a part of that, built a lot of tooling and um, we built Skipper. Um, just a quick, it's, it's not really a plug, I'm just trying to say that like this is kind of, this is why I, I feel like I can talk about Kubernetes. Um, we've got Skipper, which is a CLI tool that runs on top of Kubernetes and is kind of the, the tool that our developers touch every day and use to deploy and, and get things done. Um, cool. So this is kind of a standard slide for a lot of Kubernetes talks where people say like, you know, Kubernetes, it's a tool built by Google and, you know, it went through this big change and this big growth. I, like, there's, there's 101 talks where they go through that. Um, ultimately, the way that I want to summarize it is it's a way to take one computer and then make, well, make multiple computers look like one with a set of APIs. Um, but when it comes down to it, hey, hey, how's it going? Um, what it comes down to what does Kubernetes mean to me? And uh, to me, Kubernetes is, um, is all about the APIs. Like I, I mentioned APIs, but it, it truly is all about the APIs, right? So, and let me elaborate. So, back in the dark ages before, before containers, um, we had these virtual machines, right? <laughs> we had these clouds with all these inconsistent APIs for provisioning compute, like we were provisioning VMs and like with all these, you know, like your AWS API for EC2 was very different to like your Azure and, or your GCP API to spin up an instance. But not only that, it was also operations that kind of handled these APIs. So they would use some Terraform or, you know, I get like, they would, or CloudFormation or whatever tool it was, it was kind of like the ops area to govern these virtual machines being provisioned and run and auto-scaled. And, um, and so there's a silo off to one side. And then you had the application end, which was kind of a mix of ops and devs coming in and using like Puppet, Chef, scripts, like what, whatever it took to kind of put that layer on top of the virtual machines and um, kind of wire things together. But ultimately what that meant between these two APIs was there's an overlap of responsibility because as a developer, you may want to know more about like how the thing auto scales, like you want to be helpful and jump in and go, okay, I think we need more compute or less or um, I think we need to do this and this, like dive into the deeper internals. But that was more in the ops realm and governed by all that tooling. It was a very high, yeah, high ledge to go up. But then from the other side, then yeah, you have developers doing Puppet and Chef and, and ops were also involved. So it was very, yeah, it was a lot of overlap. So to me, with Kubernetes, it's like, why, why can't we have both? <laughs> um, and like with Kubernetes, to me, there's APIs for like routing, deployment, auto-scaling. Like it, it kind of takes all these concepts that were like best from compute and application. It kind of gives you all those APIs in one spot in relation to the application. Yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to finish it. I had to snapshot a YouTube video for that. 
But ultimately what it means is clear boundaries. So you've got operations kind of under the hood provisioning a Kubernetes cluster and running a Kubernetes cluster, but they're just providing the service to developers and to teams and providing tools and working on tools together and workflows using all these APIs and this kind of consistent naming and consistent language on how you can deploy an application. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of APIs. There's a lot of APIs in Kubernetes. Like I, the routing and all that before were very, very, very high level APIs. Um, like, sorry, high level just words to group them all together. So I'm gonna show you around some of the APIs, but first I kinda wanna talk about why this is so powerful. I, um, why these APIs mean a lot to me. So, and it kind of gets broken into three three concepts. I'm sorry if people have used a lot of Kubernetes, but um, we'll get through this. But I honestly think that these the API structure in Kubernetes is is amazing. It's the re it's the reason why Kubernetes has has won in this space, and it's all about how these APIs are structured. Um, they're all consistent. They have metadata at the top, which is a way to describe your object. So name, there's a namespace, so you can separate it from the others. Um, so you can have dev in one namespace, staging in another, or, or the dev in another namespace, and separate teams, permissions and teams by that. But metadata is all, all about naming. Spec is about saying, this is, this is what I want. This is what I want the system to do. Um, so and then it goes through this bit of code called the controller, which loops and loops and loops, and then updates the status. It says, this is what I've done. So if you could kind of summarize Kubernetes in, in one way, it's kind of like, a, it's kind of a database with a whole bunch of these control loops over the top. It's, a, it's an API with a database that just stores these objects, and then there's a whole bunch of looping code that's just constantly checking these API endpoints and making, making it happen. And this is, this is what it looks like. Um, so up, up, this is the best way. It's all YAML. So <laughs> lots and lots and lots of YAML. But, um, but on top of that, there's also this like strong versioning construct with API version in kind. So the idea, like this is demonstrated very well in the Kubernetes project itself where APIs go from like V1, alpha one, to alpha two, to alpha three, to beta, and then to stable. So just like deployments. And then they're also grouped into like apps and networking and storage. Um, th this is super, super incredibly powerful and kind of enables you to have contracts with the people that are using your APIs. Cool. Oh, so we came here to talk about Drupal. Um, so, and we're gonna go through all this, but this is just kind of the high level kickoff of like the anatomy of a Drupal application deployed with Kubernetes APIs, with the hot path being the red. So there's quite a few, so buckle up. <laughs> so the first one is uh, ingress. So the ingress API in Kubernetes is akin to vhosts in Apache or Nginx. It's the way of saying my application responds to example.com and then routes it to the right application. But it goes a little bit further than that. It, it also gives you the, yeah, gives, yeah, laughing. Uh, it gives you the ability <laughs> to, um, to do like sub routing so you can take specific paths and go off and route to a different application. So you could have a static site on the base, on the base of the domain, and then you could have slash API going off to another, another app. Um, this is also where things are governed like certificates, like you could do certificate management at this layer. Um, it's really, really powerful, but it's also um, one of those APIs that is kind of the lowest common denominator for the industry. Um, like they took all the lo cloud load balances and how people are doing ingress in the community and kind of boiled it down to this API, which is great, but it's only gonna get better in V2 and, and build up, so, um, so this is, there's still gonna be quite a bit of change here. The next one is, is service. So we're, we're just slowly working our way down the hot path. So if the first one was kind of like your traffic coming in and saying example.com, route it through, well then this is where things get routed to. 
So think of the service like an internal load balancer. It was the first thing in Kubernetes, or it was one of the first APIs in Kubernetes to get added because microservices were super hot when Kubernetes came out. And so this is a construct to give you a static IP on the Kubernetes cluster that then service A can talk to service B and the load balancer will route traffic um, round robin or sticky around the cluster. So, but the main thing for us, since a lot of our traffic is kind of external coming in, then service is kind of like that little discovery piece in the middle that's, um, that's taking that traffic and then routing it through to the right um, copy of our application. Um, other common cases where you would use this is if you deployed solar onto your cluster or you have a few backend services, then you can use a service to get a static IP for that as well. And now, and now that we've, got, we've talked about service, which is going to route to our application, there's the pod API, which is essentially a set of containers. It's a, it's a collection of containers. It's kind of like how on your Docker Compose stack locally, how you go Docker Compose up. It's just a small subset of those containers. So an example is like if you have like an Nginx FPM stack, um, a very common use case is to put Nginx and FPM in that, in that pod. Um, also maybe some, some helpers, like some sidecars. Some, like you can deploy some software that goes, hey, you know, like let's, let's check out PHP FPM. Let's see if it's healthy. Let's see what's, you know, let's see how that process is going. Maybe your app needs just like another little daemon on the side to sync some content. You can do that. You can um, deploy that as an atomic unit of your application and then basically cookie cutter it out. The system takes that pod and cookie cutters it out as many times as you want, as many copies of your application. Now, the next two, I was meant to combine these. I didn't do my homework, Santa. Um, but um, config map and secrets. So the next thing in our hot path, we've got our ingress, which routes to our service, to our app, and then we've got these other two APIs that help us connecting to our database. We need some mechanism to connect to a database to have some credentials, right? And you don't want to commit that to code. <laughs> That's very bad practice. Um, so what you do is you add them to these uh, config maps and secrets and mount them as a file system onto, into your application. So, the, so I'll go into this a little bit in a little bit more detail soon, but this is kind of that mechanism that allows you to, per environment, um, also provide like API keys and, and things like that, so, and toggle on and off features. Also, the difference between these two APIs, um, config maps is kind of a very simple uh, key value store with um, also the ability to kind of add whole arbitrary files. So it, it also, so you could add like, I don't recommend this, but you could add like your whole settings.php in there and mount it and load it. Um, but most commonly it's used as a key value. Um, secrets on the other hand are also a key value, but then they're governed a little bit differently. It's kind of, it's almost like a way, like when you go to CircleCI or any tool and you enter in like a, a username and a password, you can mark the password as secret. That's, that's, and hide it away from UI interaction and things like that. And they can be encrypted and yeah, so I, so when I think of these things, it's like config map is like your identifier, um, like your username, secrets like your password. So, so we've connected to a database and we probably need to write some files. We need some file storage. So, Kubernetes has a persistent volume claim system. Um, the whole logic around this is kind of deeply rooted in enterprise. <laughs> it's kind of the best way to put it. So let's just say I'm a developer in enterprise, and then I go, I need some storage. And then you go and like ask the storage team, can I have some storage? And they go, how much storage? It's like, oh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe 20 gigs. And then some guy will go, oh, I'll do it in two weeks or something, and then go off and grab a hard drive and then slam it into a computer and go, there's your storage. This API is the embodiment of that. There's um, a developer uses a pers persistent volume claim to say, I want 20 gigs of storage, please. It can also add a few constraints around it to say, maybe I only need, uh, like I've got multiple web heads that need to write to this thing at the same time, or 
maybe I've got like, you know, just a single block storage that I just want to mount in. That would be, the difference here would be like uh, your multiple web heads, of course, for write many. But then if you've got solar, like a single pod deployed with solar, you could use some block storage, which is more performant. Um, but yeah, and honestly, these, those two, this API and the persistent volume API under the hood, uh, those two are actually used in enterprise for that, like, you, like that manual use case that I just pointed out, like that's actually kind of a little bit in the real world too. There's like operators behind the scenes, provisioning storage and then sort of handing it back. But the developer never knows. Like they, they just say, I want storage. Um, I guess another thing to talk about is it's a way for organizations to check spend to like how much they're using, how much they've asked for. Cool. Cron, so, so we've gone through the whole hot path here. So um, you could say we've deployed the application and we're done, but then you realize that maybe you've got some staled, unscheduled content that's not going up, or, or you know things aren't being indexed into solar. Um, so that's where cron comes into it. So the best way to think about this is it's running, it's a way to put a cron, cron tab string, say run my container every five you know, every five minutes, every 10 minutes. But it, it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, this system is also not just for like us with running, running batch tasks in the background where we could run mail queues or yeah, index solar or do weird, wacky, crazy things in the background so our applications don't have to take the hit. But this API is also used for big data and um, there are entire Kubernetes clusters dedicated to the idea of having this kind of cron job and under the hood a job API where you can just schedule some work that's probably going to go off and run for a day and go across the cluster and run in parallel. And with that then comes things like deadlines and like did, if the thing failed, do we rerun again? If you know we have 10 copies of the app running and it fails three times, what do we do? That it's, it's a very, very um, complex API from that standpoint. But I've honestly found it truly rewarding, especially under the context of, of Drupal, because it really makes you start to think about like that Drush cron run and how we used to always just go to like EDC cron on a Linux host. And then we would um, just say, oh, run every two minutes. But maybe that task run, runs longer than two minutes. And cron doesn't respect that. So now you've got like this stampede of background tasks. So it really forces you to think about your background tasks and setting limits and how that all works. Yeah, so, so cron's, cron's pretty fun. <laughs> cool. So, so we've covered a lot here. Um, ingress for accepting specific traffic. Service for load balancing it around internally. Pod for serving your application. Yeah, I've even got one of these. Um, and then config a map for connecting to like a database or a backend storage or, or even S3 or some service. And then your persistent volume claims for, um, for storage and cron for that, those pesky background tasks. Cool. So you're done. <laughs> You now know all the APIs, and you're like, Nick, that was very, very, very high level. And it was. Um, <laughs> um, and from here, it's really like, how do you get started? Like, where, what's the best way to get started? And you know what? Like, everybody says YAML. Let's, let's use YAML. Like, like just like, here's, here's all the YAML. That was the definitely, in the early days, the promise was like, you know, oh, a couple of YAML files and your app's deployed. It's simple. But honestly, it's not. It's, um, YAML is really getting turned into and seen as more like the machine code and people are building tools on top. Um, yeah, I, I, had to, I had to include it. <laughs> Actually, there's a whole Twitter account for that, so I'll, I'll tweet about it later. But some, like, I think it's meme and eddies. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So, so no. um, anyway. But what this means is there's a, a bunch of high-level tools that kind of govern this workflow and provision. So um, the first one I had to make mention of is, um, is Customize because it's actually baked into the Kubernetes command line client. 
it's, it's a little bit of a deep dive, but the whole idea is it's um, kind of layering. So you could have some base YAML files and then just layer things on top. So like changing versions and updating storage. It's, it's still, to me, like a bit of a rudimentary building block to build on top of. But um, it's definitely definitely worth mentioning since it's actually integrated with the tooling now as a workflow option. Yeah. The other one's Helm. And um, this has a big, vibrant ecosystem. It's, um, Helm's kind of like a package manager for your cluster. It's like apt yum. They kind of market it as apt or yum for your cluster. And I think that's a, a really, really, really good way of looking at it because it, it'll get you started really, really quickly. Um, Helm 3 is out now, which has um, kind of solved a lot of the shortcomings. So it's a very, very simple tool to use now. Um, and yeah, there's, there's uh, Drupal, Drupal packages like available to kind of get you started. But I kind of alluded to this before that uh, Kubernetes is a, a platform for platforms. So uh, we've got all this YAML and it's, it's kind of like the machine's version of how to run things and we need some higher level abstractions over the top because um, ultimately like we all, we all have opinions. So we all have opinions about how we deploy our applications and manage them and run them. And um, so that kind of draws the conclusion that, yeah, Kubernetes is the platform for opinions. That's, that's the way I, I like to think about it. Um, but we still have those common APIs on, under the hood that we can talk about. That's, that's the difference here. Like we can go off and write these custom workflows and talk about things. But since we have this sort of higher level base, now we can actually talk about what those differences are instead of diving into like two sets of code and two teams and it's, it's incredibly powerful. So I, I actually want to talk about a couple of our opinions as we've gone through this. I want to make changes to that, to that chart that I had before and talk about things that we've gone through. And the first one is um, decoupling Nginx and FPM. So, um, for us, we, like that pod before, we split it out. We, we take Nginx out, we take FPM out, we run them separately. The reasoning for this is because we want them to scale independently. That's, that's key. Like, uh, we, want, we don't want Nginx forcing our FPM, um, us to have more and more and more FPM instances. And we don't want FPM forcing more and more and more Nginx instances. The, the real, in the real world, it's really, really tough to scale that out when you have sort of two moving targets. Um, because you've got this one instance and you have to say, okay, well, let's scale by, like, if you're not just scaling by CPU and memory and you start to think about, well, you have to slice it up. So Nginx has its own CPU and memory and FPM has its own CPU and memory in that pod. And if one starts to spike, then yeah, it'll keep going. So we split them. And then we put tools around that as well to kind of govern that. So, um, so for Nginx, we still scale by CPU and memory, but the key for us is, um, and I'll cover later, is we've got some tooling around FPM so we can scale around procs as well. So CPU, memory, and the amount of processes that are running. Cool. Uh, the other one was around the config map and secret side. So, um, so we do use both of these APIs, but then we kind of take it to the next next step, we double it again. So we actually have four of these four of these API objects, and the idea here is we reserve two for the system, so that's automation, and then the other one, uh, the other two are for users. So the idea is, like you kind of have this safe target for automation to um, go through and say, here's my database credentials, here's my solar credentials, here's some S3. Um, we can safely put all that in the one config map in secret without worrying about running it, rolling over the top of a user's provided um, secret. So, and that's what the other two are for. So developers can add their own API keys and, or, com and, or configs or toggles. So, so splitting that up has worked out really, really well for us. And like I mentioned before, it was auto scale by process. So um, Kubernetes has this auto-scaling um, framework. It's almost a framework now is the best way to put it. And we expose the FPM metrics to the system and then scale by that. So we have like a little, I mentioned sidecars. I mentioned adding little daemons to your, to your pod as it deploys out. 
and we have a little one that sits there and goes, hey, FPM, how many, how many processes you got? How many processes you got? And that's, and that's it, and then it just exposes it to the system. So, and then that allows us to, um, especially with Nginx FPM, if anybody's looked at like your new relic graphs, like when you get a spike, you also see that like that green spike in there, which is like queued tasks, like when um, FPM's queuing, queuing up requests. And that's where this, this is kind of the other side of it where we can cover it as well. So, so we don't only, we kind of cover all the edge cases, CPU, memory, and, and process. So, so <laughs> this, is, this is what our, ours ends up as. I'm, I'm not saying that, that you should go out and do this. I, not, not in a, like, I, I think we all have opinions about how we run our applications and how we want to run our applications. But, um, but this is kind of what we landed on as, as, a best, as a best system for running, running Drupal. Um, so the ingress is just up here, and the hot path is still very the same, except, except for these three, yeah, where we've now come through and gone, OK, well, this is just Nginx, and now we go to a service to then route to our FPM processes. And then we go down and um, mounting config maps and secrets and storage. The other, the other thing I really want to point out is from a security standpoint, um, all, like this pod and this pod are actually, they're all read-only with mounted file systems in there for public, private, and temporary. So it, we've got a very strong security posture. But on top of that, because they're split out, like you can kind of see at this pod, the, um, for Nginx, it loads up the public file system, but it never touches temporary or private. Because Nginx doesn't need to know about your private files or your temporary files. Like it's those file systems always go through a PHP process to check permissions or to generate something, so you can totally eliminate those out of the picture, which is I I think that's super super cool. And then of course your FPM gets everything, and you've still got cron, kind of in the same spot. Cool. Um, now for us. Like that's a lot of API. <laughs> that's a that's a lot to manage, and we have a lot a lot of websites, and it it would be really hard to manage and maintain all that YAML. So in Kubernetes, there's this whole idea of a custom resource definition, and what that does is give us the power to create our own APIs in the system. So all these APIs that I've covered are core APIs. But now we can also build our own, our own workflows and set up our own contracts and kind of use it as a building block to build our own systems. And a lot of our building blocks, like in fact, like the, the one that runs Drupal, they're all available in the Skipper Operator project. Um, and it looks, well, it looks a lot more like that, <laughs> a lot more than that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see we've just reserved apps.skipper.io in Kubernetes, and then we've got kind Drupal. So um, the project also contains um, operators for managing like auxiliary services, so things like CloudFront, Certificate Manager. Like where we we use a lot of AWS, and um, and so we also use the system to automate that instead. So it's a lot more dynamic. But, um, but I think there could be a lot of people here that saw a lot of this and went, well, that was a wild ride all the way through. There was a lot going on there. And look, it's the way I see it, and when I talk to a lot of people, I, the way that I like to frame it is like, it's, it's a steep learning curve, but it's, totally, like, it's absolutely worth it. Because knowing these APIs and understanding these APIs like I've said, gives you a common language to talk about how things are deployed, how things are run, and it also allows you to kind of, yeah, like manage, yeah. It's, it's all about that collaboration, that talking, yeah. Cool. Um, but if you want to come have a chat, learn a bit more about this, there will, be, there, will be some more demo, there will be some demos and things like that at our BOF. I should have put it up. It's on the board. It's at 2 o'clock. It's after the keynote. So we have the keynote slot, then a break, and then in the boff room, 
we'll, we'll be in there. We want to talk about, well, we want to talk about Skipper, but also talk about Kubernetes. We want to bring in people to talk about Kubernetes. Cool. Um, yeah, sweet. Any, any questions? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Mike. Yeah, you're on Mike. You said you transitioned from development to DevOps. Yeah. What helped you to transition and helped you to get started? Oh, that's that's a yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, because a lot of a lot of my journey like um, started with CI. Like it, it it really did start with CI. Um, as a developer, um, I think it was like six or seven years ago. I, we kind of went, oh, well, we want to run coding standards over our, you know, over our code base. And then it kind of just went from there mm. to the next, to the next, to the next. So I guess the best way is like I, I found a use case, which was I want to improve our tests. And then so I kind of owned CI. Mm. And um, then that led to talking about like oh, working in, well, how can we improve our local dev stacks and doing that? And then Around that time, I, I was a little bit lucky because Kubernetes and Docker kind of happened, and and then there was this new wave, and it can be overwhelming, um, but I think there's a lot more resource and a lot more best practice out there. So I think it's all about finding those um, those use cases mm -hmm. because um, because diving in um, without one is is really really hard to navigate, um, and we also have the um, Drupal Slack channel, like the Kubernetes Slack mm -hmm. channel, to and the DevOps one, we have a community going, so which which we're happy to to point you to the right, the right places because it can be super overwhelming, especially with, with Kubernetes. I can um, believe that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, hey. I'm curious about whether you're using Prometheus or Open Tracing or Jaeger or those kind of distributed tracing tools to oh, yeah. get insights into. We are where your requests are ending up and how they're being handled. Yeah, we are we are slowly moving into into more of that. Um, our monitoring stack is um, operates at a at a couple of levels. We we don't use Prometheus um, because it's it, there's a lot of cognitive load when running it. It can be pretty overwhelming. There's a lot of metrics um, involved there, which is fine. Um, so we. But we still record kind of the basics around CPU memory around that path. We have a another project for the actual cluster itself because not only do those APIs work for provisioning, they also have status conditions. So we can we've got like a HTTP endpoint for all our clusters, kind of like a help Z for your entire cluster that then goes in and checks like um, is Kubernetes reporting that it can't auto scale right now because that's that's a big that's a big problem if you get hit by traffic. Um, and then we also rely on tools like New Relic. Um, in terms of tracing, um, we're looking at using like a, like we like to use a lot of AWS managed services to kind of take that take that load off, especially given we're running EKS. So um, we're starting to look at that um, gateway, like the AWS app, um, app mesh. Yeah, too many meshes. Yeah. <laughs> I have one, if I can. Um, yeah. You saw that you or you showed us that you have a pod for nginx and pod for PHP FPM. Yep. And you're mounting the file system. I assume that means the code is baked inside. Yeah. And it's basically the same code baked in nginx and the same code baked yes. in PHP. Yep. Yeah, it is. Um, so we, so as a part of our build process, we we actually build three containers or or four. We push three. So. Um, so the idea is we compile the code into one image and then which is everything from like composer to building your style guide to e everything it takes to kind of prep the code and then it gets copied into into three images a little bit in the weeds but the first one's like nginx codes in there uh, fpm new codes available and then we have a cli container which has a whole bunch of extra tools and runs batch and cron and things like that and the idea there is to kind of separate the responsibilities a bit, have less code running in different things. So Nginx just does Nginx, FPM's the same. And then your CLI, you could add extra scripts and extra tools and things like that that can run in the background. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to demo that um, 
in the buff as well. Um, do you have any thoughts on using something like OpenShift on top of Kubernetes, or is that something you steered away from? It's it's something we've steered away from. Um, it's it's um, it's almost like another system on top, which adds a lot of a lot of a lot of cognitive load. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's so that's definitely one reason why we've kind of kind of steered away from it. Um, it's but it's not just yeah OpenShift. It's things like Rancher and. Um, they all have a lot of their own ways for, and, the, and these are fine, these are totally fine, like they all have their own ways for provisioning and running in um, Kubernetes. But, um, but there's a lot of community that's matured with this for, for provisioning, running Kubernetes itself. And um, I think there's a real power to um, just having that bare Kubernetes layer and then picking whatever tools you want on top, being kind of almost yeah, separated from the stack itself. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Any? No? Oh, oh, hey. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's Thank super you. interesting. Um, I was wondering, do you have any um, data on how much time, for example, the system takes to auto scale? How it takes to auto scale? I don't actually. Um, I'm just trying to think where we might have some data around that. I'd have to. I'd have to go looking. Um, but to talk to auto scaling, like there is definitely an art to it. Um, there's absolutely an art because um, because I think there's like a real. It's a, it's a balance because. Um, you can provision lots and lots and lots of little containers and make them auto scale out, but maybe that doesn't fit the nature of your application. So, um, because maybe you have some heavier processes that run in there, so you want a little bit more breathing room to be able to take in all those requests and then keep scaling out. So, in terms of, I, I don't have data on like how quickly things auto scale, but um, I can definitely point out that there's. Um, yeah, a lot of work that it's it's a lot it's a lot harder to just say we we just auto scale. Um, there's yeah, there's a lot of art that goes into kind of right sizing your applications and making sure that you can kind of take that hit while the auto scaler also kicks in. So, um, but that's also tunable in the auto scaler itself and how often it scrapes. So, um, I think it, I think it's like every fifteen seconds it'll scrape and and then ramp up. And then from there, scaling down is like every five minutes. And it's just got a watermark. And if it goes over, then it'll keep pumping it up. If it doesn't, then it'll just slowly, slowly work it down as well. So yeah, cool. Oh, hey. Um, is there any oh. difference? Oh, <laughs> sorry very much. Hi. Um, is there any difference in having your Nginx and um, FBM containers separated rather than as sidecars like if you had pods mm -hmm. they're in a sidecar or if you have them as two separate pods is there any advantage or disadvantage to either yeah method um i i think there's a simplicity in um in keeping them together that's for sure um so yeah separating them allows you to auto scale independently like that's that's a big big win for us but then it does also Include you've got to kind of account for nginx knowing where to route and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I I'm not real definitely not ruling out like an nginx fpm in the same in the same pod, um, and like especially for deploying an application and getting it out and, and running it. That's I think that's totally fine. Um, just trying to think, I had something else. No, I think I think that's it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> thought I had some point around. Yeah. Uh, just on that, I'm just curious around. Um, do you have to use like pod affinity when you separate them out to make sure they're running on the same node, or do you see any network we, latency across? Yeah, both nodes? both sides, like nginx and fpm. We we set pod affinity to spread them out because our our primary goal is is that high availability. So yeah, we don't want to. Yeah, so we just spread it out as much as we can. Um, and like that, that network yeah. latency between Nginx and FPM, yeah. is that is that 
UK or have you yeah, seen it's, issues with that? Yeah, it's, it hasn't been a problem to this point. And honestly, like a lot of the, when we've gone through things and gone, oh, like this is a bit slow, those um, FPM has, we have this log that gets written out from FPM that says the request took X seconds. And that is like a godsend because it allows you to kind of like, and that's where tracing comes into it too, of course, like tracking it through. But in a very simple way, you can, like we've gone to tail our FPM logs, gone well, that process actually takes five seconds or 10 seconds. We, we need to look into that. And that's always been where it is. Um, so, yeah. And what about yeah. Redis to use? Redis? Redis? Yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah uh, we used to mem use Memcache, and now we've kind of transitioned over to Redis. I blame Nick San Maria. Uh, <laughs> no, he's the expert. <laughs> Are you using yeah. Elasticache? Uh, yes, yeah. So we're using Elasticache for that. So um, to run and manage and maintain that. So, yeah. Yep. Um, what's the difference between Redis and Memcache? Do you use them together, or is it better just to use one? Oh, um, I won't pick sides. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I guess, so they're, I mean, they're both good services and they both serve the same kind of need in some way. Like for us, especially under the Drupal lens, it's all about taking those like very expensive transactions and, and taking the result and then storing it and then serving it back and putting that into Memcache or or um, Redis, that's, it, it could go either way. And for us, we, we picked Redis because that was sort of where our operational experience went with managing it. Um, and I think it just comes down to feature set from there. Like Redis has some things around queues and first in, first out baked in, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, we, we don't really, uh, sorry. Is it possible to use them together or will there be no benefit? I, I think you would get your maximum benefit from, from picking one, okay. um, for sure. Um, because they're both going to be that in-memory key value store that's going to serve it back. So, um, so just keeping with, I think just keeping with one is, is fine. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Oh.